Subcommittee of Oversight will come to order. Um, today's hearing is the President's, uh, on, on the President's job and stimulus um, package that was just delivered to Congress yesterday. Um, we'll start with an opening statement from the Chair and then from our uh, friend and ranking member, Mr. Kucinich, and then get right into testimony. In early 2009, President Obama sold the stimulus as his solution to the recession and skyrocketing unemployment. The President worked with House and Senate Democrats to pass the stimulus as quickly as possible, promising that the unemployment rate would, go, would not go above 8 percent, uh, 8 percent once the bill was passed. The administration assailed critics by claiming that there was a consensus amongst economists that a massive spending bill was in the country's best interest. The President and others claimed the stimulus would create 3 to 4 million new jobs. Yet over two and a half years later, 1.7 million fewer Americans have jobs at a cost of $825 billion to taxpayers. The unemployment rate has climbed above 8 percent, as we all know. Um, the President was 8 percent the month the President signed the stimulus and has stayed above that point ever since. Currently, only 55 percent of Americans have full-time jobs and 25 million, million Americans are unemployed. 25 million Americans unemployed or cannot find full-time jobs. That is more than twice the population of the State that the ranking member and I come from. Last month, the U.S. economy had zero job growth the first month that has happened since the Second War. No matter how you look at the stimulus, it simply failed to live up to the Administration's promises. However, Mr. Uh, President Obama has never admitted any failure. Instead, he has continued to mislead the American people by praising the benefits of the stimulus package and at times has claimed, quote, it worked exactly as we anticipated. And now the President wants more. Last Thursday, he announced he wanted a new $447 billion stimulus package. The President claimed that this new American Jobs Act will, quote, provide a jolt to an economy that has stalled, almost the exact same language Vice President Biden used to describe the 2009 stimulus when he said it would provide a, quote, necessary jolt to our economy. We all know that the first stimulus did not provide that jolt, but the similarities between 2009 and 2011 go beyond the Administration's rhetoric. Stimulus Part II contains many of the same spending priorities that failed to create jobs under the first one, throwing billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars in taxpayer money around at ill-advised projects did not create jobs the first time, and it will not create jobs under a second so-called stimulus bill. We need an honest discussion about our economy and not just rhetoric. Millions of unemployed Americans are depending on it. Before we consider the President's second package, we must examine the results of the first one to learn from them and prevent ourselves from making the same mistakes. In fact, I have said many times, if big government spending were going to get us out of this mess, well, for goodness sakes, we should have been out of it a long time ago. I mean, that is all the government has done for the last three years. And you can even take that back to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the previous administration to some degree. This administration has obviously taken it to a whole new level. And as the facts point out, and as we just talked about, it does not work. Instead of rushing to pass additional spending, we need to ensure that any new legislation is carefully crafted and actually facilitates job creation. Today's hearing brings together economic and financial experts from a wide array of backgrounds to discuss this so-called second stimulus. I hope that this hearing will bring to bear what we have learned over the past several years and how we can move forward to create an environment favorable to job creation and economic growth, one that is conducive to job creation and not an impediment to uh, that fact. And with that, I now recognize my good friend, the distinguished member from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The most recent figures paint a stark picture of the U.S. economy. Employers did not add any jobs in August, and only 35,000 jobs were added over the last three months. Unemployment remains at 8.1 percent. And although the economy added 2.4 million private sector jobs between February 2010 and July 2011, these gains were partially offset by the loss of 402,000 public se sector jobs at the State and local level during the same period. The problem we are facing is that growth is too slow. The Economic Policy Institute just released a report that found that there are approximately 11.1 million fewer jobs than needed and 6.8 million fewer jobs than when the recession started. To bring down the unemployment rate and stay even with adult population growth, our economy should be creating 400,000 jobs per month. But as the EPI report notes, over the last six months the economy has added uh, only an average of 144,000 jobs each month. And in August, most private sector jobs added were in social services 
or in health care. Now, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I have several documents I would like to put into the record by unanimous consent. Uh, the first is a Paul Krugman analysis. Chairman Issa issued a staff report Thursday claiming that the entire stimulus failed. One of the key assertions in this report is that the stimulus somehow destroyed a million jobs. To support this conclusion, Chairman Issa's uh, staff report cites a single study, one study, an analysis issued in May 2011 by researchers at Ohio State University. Unfortunately, this study has been widely discredited by economists because of its flawed methodology. So the first document I would like to enter into the record is an analysis by economist and Nobel laureate Paul Krugman called Stupid Stimulus Tricks. Without objection. Uh, I, I just want to uh, quote, uh, cite one paragraph of what it says. It says, quote, so here is another, the stimulus didn't work paper, making the rounds, and as usual being seized on by people who have no idea what the issues are with this kind of estimation. The instruments, variables used to correct for possible two-way causation are weak and dubious. The best interpretation is that the authors tried something that happened to give the results they wanted, then stop looking. Really, this isn't the sort of thing worth wasting time over. Uh, the uh, uh, second analysis I want to be made part of the official record is an analysis by Dean Baker. Uh, and uh, this is analysis that also faults the methodology of the Ohio State University report. Without objection. I just want to uh, quote a paragraph from there. It says, with an exercise like this, talking about the report, you always have to worry about the problem of cherry picking. For this reason, you usually want to run your regressions a variety of different ways to show the results do not depend on some arbitrary specification. It doesn't look like they have done this, or at least they didn't show much evidence of such robust tests in their paper." Unquote. Uh, finally, the uh, CBO report, uh, I ask unanimous consent that this be entered into the record. It is a report on a subject. Now, Mr. Chairman, this CBO report is cited in the uh, very first footnote of the Chairman Issa's staff report. But the staff report omits the key passage from the CBO report that undercut the entire argument that the stimulus failed. To the contrary, the CBO report says the stimulus worked. It says this. CBO estimates that the ARRA's policies had the following effects in the second quarter of the calendar year 2011 compared with what would have occurred otherwise. Here is what they cite. They raised the real gross domestic product by between uh, 0 0.8 percent and 2.5 percent. Uh, they lowered, excuse me, They, they lowered the unemployment rate by between 0.5 percent and 1.6 percentage point. They increased the number of people employed by between 1 million and 2.9 million, and they increased the number of full-time equivalent jobs by 1.4 million to 4 million. The CBO report makes exactly the opposite point as uh, the Chairman's re uh, staff report. Uh, so I ask unanimous consent. And, and the, the reason why I brought this to the uh, Committee's attention is that there are errors. Uh, in, in the staff report, and they could cause people to be misled. And I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I think that it is important that, uh, that the Committee is apprised of this so that in our deliberations we can consider this additional information. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to, uh, uh, as, as the Chair knows, I am not someone who is a reflexive supporter of the Administration. Uh, if I, if I, I, I don't think the stimulus went far enough. Uh, but it did do something, and I wanted to make sure that that was put in the record. I thank the uh, gentleman for his time. Thank you. Thank the uh, ranking member. Um, it is the practice of this committee to um, swear in all witnesses. So if you all stand, please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? If you do, answer in the affirmative. Let the record show everyone answered in the affirmative. Um, in order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to, uh, to five minutes, and your entire written testimony will be um, made part of the record. And uh, I want to introduce our, our panel here. We have first Professor John Taylor. He is the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University and the George P. Schultz Senior Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for being with us again. Uh, Ms. Diana Furchkut Roth is a Senior Fellow at Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. Thank you for being with us this morning. Dr. Heather Boucher is a senior economist at the Center for American Progress. I want to thank you for joining us as well. And then we have Mr. Peter Schiff, Chief Executive Officer of Euro Pacific Capital. Um, 
And uh, Mr. Brink Lindsay is the senior scholar at the Coffin Foundation. Gentlemen, thank you both for being with us this morning as well. Uh, we'll go right down the list here. Um, we'll start with Mr. Taylor, and each of you have five minutes. So fire away. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, other members of the committee for holding this hearing, which is very important. As both you and the ranking member indicated, unemployment is tragically high at this point. And also, as you both indicated, the reason for that is economic growth is so low. Uh, businesses aren't starting up enough, they are not expanding enough, and they are not hiring enough to reduce unemployment from these very high levels. In my view, based on my studies and others, I think the fiscal policy responses to this so far have been largely ineffective. They may have even made things worse. They have largely been of the form of temporary targeted interventions rather than comprehensive economic strategy. Economic growth in this recovery has been 2.4 percent. It is almost not a recovery at all. And that compares to 6.5 percent in the recovery from the last deep recession. From 83 to 84, that recovery had growth of 6.5 percent. I have a chart in my testimony which shows the striking difference. So I do think we need a new economic policy, one that focuses on sustained higher growth. Unfortunately, the proposal the President announced last week is really more of the same as what we have had for the last few years, temporary targeted programs um, and now even with permanent tax increases down the road. It is much like the 2009 stimulus when you look at it. 307 billion of the 447 are temporary reductions in tax payments. We did that in 2009. It didn't work. When I look at where the money went, and it's very important not to just use regressions, not just to use models, but to look where the money went. When I look at where the money went, it largely stayed in people's pockets. They didn't spend it. It didn't jumpstart consumption or the economy. When you look back at previous episodes like this, these temporary interventions, you see the same thing. 1975, President Ford signed one of these. His own Council of Economic Advisers said it didn't work effectively, concluding after that, and I quote, tax reduction should be permanent rather than the form of temporary rebates. Then you just tried 1977, the same thing, same assessment. Fortunately, we had a couple of decades where we didn't do these things, and economic growth was strong. Then we did a 2001, we had one, 2008, and then 2009. The record is very clear. These do not work effectively. $140 billion of the 477 is in the form of grants uh, to State and local governments, other entities, to increase spending. This also we tried in 2009 stimulus. I looked at this in detail, looked at where the money went. It didn't work. These State and local governments largely put these funds in their coffers and you see very little impact on infrastructure. In fact, it went down. We also have experiences in the past. 1977-78, President Carter had a jobs-oriented program like this. It was a public works program when he was sent to the States. The same thing happened. We should learn from these experiences. Don't keep trying these things. Now, some say it would have been worse, and, Mr. Kucinich, you are referring to some of these studies. They are based on models. People simulate models. They say it will work in advance. They simulate the same models to show it worked after the fact. It is no new information. They are not looking at where the money went. I hope people recognize that. So from my point of view, more of these kinds of policies will not effectively lower unemployment. Um, I think they are a mistake. A much better approach is to lay out a lasting permanent economic strategy. I would build on the Budget Control Act which was signed this summer. That makes some progress. It doesn't go all the way. But if you bring spending down further, uh, I would bring it to levels just of 2007 as a share of GDP. What is so hard about that? If you do that, you can do it without increasing taxes, with a tax reform that is revenue neutral, and allow for a regulatory reform and monetary reform as well. To me, that is the best, most promising way to reduce unemployment, to get this economy going much more effective than more temporary targeted interventions, which we have seen do not work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Um, we will go next to Ms. Roth. 
Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to submit my written testimony for the record. Um, I agree with uh, everything Professor Taylor said, and I don't want to repeat what he said. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, move on to the later parts of my testimony. One of the things that we're doing increasingly in the United States is making it harder for employers to hire workers. We run the risk of getting back to a normal GDP growth path, about 25 or 3 percent a year, but still having employers choose to hire fewer workers than they did previously. And I'd like to go through just a few reasons for that. One is the new health care tax that's going to take place in 2014. Starting from 2014, employers who don't have the right kind of health insurance will have to pay $2,000 per worker per year. And employers who do have the right kind of health insurance but whose workers uh, uh, have low incomes uh, and the premiums are higher than 9.5 percent of the worker's household income will have to pay $3,000 per worker per year. This imposes a great disincentive to hiring moving from 49 uh, to 50 workers after the subtraction for uh, the 30 workers that are exempt, cost of business $40,000 a year. So you can see that many businesses are planning ahead. The administration says this tax only takes effect in 2014, and so it doesn't matter. But businesses do plan ahead. And the tax also affects franchises, which are groups of firms. So if you're running a McDonald's, for example, and it's part of a franchise of half a dozen McDonald's, then your number of workers uh, would very well exceed 49. Uh, and you might be competing against another small independent firm with just 49 workers. You'd be at a competitive disadvantage. Interestingly enough, the tax doesn't apply to part-time workers. So the incentive would be for employers to reduce the hours of their full-time workers. Uh, and hire more part-time workers. If you hire two part-time workers instead of one full-time worker, you are exempt from the tax. This isn't the kind of incentive we want to give employers. There's also, uh, apart from health care, there's different regulations that make it increasingly difficult to hire. <laughs> President Obama admitted this when he uh, put a hold on the ozone regulation. Uh, he did that the week before last, saying uh, that this is not the right time for such a regulation. Well, I went to the Unified Spring Regulatory Agenda at www.reginfo.gov, and I counted the number of EPA regulations. There are 308 regulations in process. Uh, that means there are still 307 that are moving forward. And I didn't, this doesn't even count the 36 completed regulations, completed actions. Uh, these might seem small, but if you are an employer, say a farmer, uh, there is a regulation that is going to tell you how you have to feed your cattle and how you have to dispose of the manure. Uh, if you sell pesticides, there is a regulation that says what kind of pesticide uh, labeling you have to put on this. They seem small to perhaps you and me, but to these employers, they are a big impediment for doing business. Uh, the EPA also has major regulations on utilities, boilers, farm dust, greenhouse gases. Moving on to the Labor Department, uh, the EPA would still allow coal production. We just wouldn't be able to use it in our power plants. We would be allowed to ship it to China. But the Labor Department has regulations on coal dust that would prevent us even from mining the coal and getting it out of the ground and shipping it to China for them to use. Again, this affects geographic areas that are already very much hurt in our recession. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board, in its charges against Boeing for opening a second plant in South Carolina, is sending a chilling effect to any employers, especially those who want to locate in the more unionized states. So any um, manufacturer in Canada that is thinking of perhaps opening a plant on the border, just across the border, and maybe Michigan or, or Ohio, is thinking, well, if I open this plant, then if I want to open a second one, maybe in Alabama, I won't be allowed to do that. So maybe I should open the first one further south. And uh, General Electric moved its GE headquarters to China. They didn't get any problem from the NLRB. Uh, the message goes, if you offshore your work, you are fine. If you open a second plant here in the United States, uh, we are going to cause problems. Finally, in the last nine seconds, I would like to mention that uh, we need to do more in terms of importing entrepreneurs. 
Senators Kerry and Luger have proposed a bill that would allow more visas for employers abroad who want to create jobs here, entrepreneurs. Uh, if they create jobs, then after five years we give them a green card. This is the kind of costless reform we need to be considering. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Boucher. Thank you, Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Kucinich, for inviting me here to testify today. My name is Heather Boucher, and I am Senior Economist at the Center for American Progress Action Fund. The American Jobs Act includes proposals that will create jobs by investing in infrastructure, putting teachers back in schools, targeting tax cuts for, towards small businesses, and helping the unemployed. Independent economic forecasters say that the plan will boost growth and employment, and I provide details on this in my written testimony. Presidents and Congresses of all political stripes, including the Bush administration, have embraced short-term temporary fiscal expansion to create jobs in times of labor market weakness. An empirically grounded body of literature documents the effectiveness of fiscal expansion, and again, I document that in my testimony. Denying that there was any impact of fiscal expansion in recent years is an ideological, not empirically based stance. The American Jobs Act builds on what we know works to get people back to work. Investments in infrastructure, both human and physical capital, will pe put people to work now and yield lasting benefits for the economy. These investments should raise U.S. E economic output by about $220 billion, above what it would otherwise be. It will prevent up to 280,000 teacher layoffs and keep police officers and firefighters on the job. It will modernize and upgrade our school infrastructure, community colleges, and invest immediately in highway, highway safety, transit, passenger rail, and aviation. This is much needed spending. The accumulated backlog of deferred maintenance and repair in schools is at least $270 billion, and the American Society of Civil Engineers estimates that we need to spend at least $2.2 trillion over the next five years just to repair our crumbling infrastructure. Increased investments in infrastructure have saved or created 1.1 million jobs in the construction industry and 400,000 jobs in manufacturing through this spring. Almost all of these jobs were in the private sector. Upgrading roads, bridges, and other basic infrastructure not only creates jobs, but lowers the cost of doing business and paves the way for businesses, small, medium, and large, to be more competitive. And they put people to work earning good middle class incomes, which expands the consumer base for businesses. The American Jobs Act also cuts payroll taxes and provides a tax holiday on new hires, but focuses these tax cuts on small businesses. In 2010, 50 House Republicans co sponsored similar legislation. Tax cuts are an effective way to boost the economy when demand is low, although the multipliers are smaller than for other expenditures, such as unemployment benefits and infrastructure investments. The American Jobs Act will help the long-term unemployed. Unemployment benefits kept an average of 1.6 million American workers in jobs every quarter during the recession. During the past 40 years, Congress has not once allowed benefits for the long-term unemployed to expire when the unemployment rate was above 7.2 percent, and as already been noted, that is 1.9 points lower than it is today. The American Jobs Act will also provide every worker with a payroll tax cut. The typical household earning less than $50,000 will receive about $1,500. This is paid for by limiting itemized deductions and certain exemptions for high-income families, taxing invest investment fund managers' income as ordinary income, eliminating certain oil and gas indice tax breaks, and changing the corporate de de depreciation rules. This is a good set of pay-fors. The economy does not have a supply-side problem. Since December 2008, the non-financial corporate sector has seen profits rise by over 100 percent, and they are holding almost $1.9 trillion, $1 trillion in cash, the highest level since the fourth quarter of 1959. Recent regulatory changes are not, also not the reason for today's high unemployment. I mean, let's go back to basics. As the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission found, it was a lack of regulation that was a key factor in creating today's economic crisis and putting 14 million people out of work. The problem is demand. The collapse of the housing bubble drained trillions from our economy, followed by a financial crisis which has left 14 million people unemployed, meaning that households quite simply have less to spend. There is less money flowing through our economy. As Bill Gross, founder and chief investment officer of the world's largest bond fund, PIMCO, said recently, we need to create a demand for labor. The private sector is not going to do it. 
And the question that before this committee is how will bringing down spending increase growth, government spending increase growth, when already interest rates are, are at record lows and we have trillions that have been taken out of our economy because of the collapse of the housing bubble? Quite simply, it won't. The National Federation of Independent Businesses, which represents small business owners, reported in August, as it has each month since mid-2009, that it is weak sales that are the problem. There are clear steps that we can do to create jobs, and the American Jobs Act is a real step forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Doctor. Mr. Schiff. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Peter Schiff, and I guess you can say I am in the economic and financial gloom and doom business. And thanks to this body, uh, President Obama, the Federal Reserve, business is booming. And, you know, I, I would rather profit from America's success rather than her failure, which is the reason that I'm here today. We have some serious structural problems underlying the U.S. economy, and we cannot solve them until we understand them. As a nation, we have borrowed and spent our way into a gigantic ditch. We are not going to get out of the ditch by digging it deeper. We have to reverse the mistakes of the past, not repeat them. Government stimulus will never grow this economy. It will never create jobs. <clears throat> it is the equivalent of trying to put out a fire by pouring gasoline on it. We have to understand that the housing bubble, the financial crisis of 2008, two events that I predicted and warned about, were the consequences of government stimulus. We stimulated our way into this problem. We are not going to stimulate our way out. In fact, the stimulus is actually a sedative. The stimulus is preventing the free market from unraveling the problems that years of bad monetary and fiscal policy have created. We don't need more spending. We need the opposite of spending. We need underconsumption. What the economy lacks is savings, investment, production. And if we try to preserve the jobs of the bubble economy with more reckless money printing and borrowing and government spending, all we are going to succeed in doing is preventing the restructuring that we need and preventing more productive jobs from ever coming into existence. And I want to talk you know, specifically about jobs. I am an employer. I employ about 150 people. I would probably employ 1,000 more if it weren't for government regulations that have inhibited my ability to hire and grow my business and have forced me to move for portions of my business overseas in order to escape the regulatory burden here. But the question is, why do I hire people? Where are these jobs coming from? You know, jobs in a free market, uh, they come from two things. They come from profits or the profit motive, and they come from capital. You need both to create jobs. And in a free market, there's going to be jobs. And if there aren't enough jobs, Congress has to ask, what are we doing to inhibit this process? How are we preventing jobs that would normally be here from coming into existence? Now, in order for me to hire somebody, I have to be able to make a profit. That means that the person I hire has to deliver to me more value than the cost of employing them. And the cost of employing them is not just the wages I pay them, but it is all the mandatory benefits, the taxes, and more importantly, the legal liability that I incur when I hire somebody. In fact, one of the riskiest things you can do in America is to hire somebody. And because of that reason, because of all the liability uh, from government, from lawsuits that you have put on employers, most small businesses, the, their main concern is how not to hire people. How can I grow my business and hire as few people as possible? That is not something that happens in the market. That is something that happens as a consequence of government. The other thing that you need to create jobs, in addition to profit, is capital. People work for me because I have capital. I have tools that my employees lack. They come to work, I give them an office, I give them secretarial support, I, I give them computers, I give them leads, I give them a brand, I give them all sorts of things. But where does capital come from? It comes from savings. It comes from underconsumption. Either I have to save it myself or I have to borrow it from somebody else. But there is no money to borrow because it is all going to government or something that government guarantees, like education or home mortgages. Uh, there is no credit available uh, for small businesses. It is actually a paradox, but what we need is higher interest rates. Higher interest rates encourage savings. These low interest rates are of no benefit to typical businesses. Yeah, it benefits government. Government can borrow all this money through the bond market. Some of the major corporations have access to cheap money. Wall Street can gamble with it. But small businesses, they can't sell bonds. They need to borrow money, uh, and there is no savings available. There is nothing there. So businesses can't get capital, 
and there is no incentive now to hire because the costs are too high. You are looking at somebody who is sitting here who is actually fined, and I would be happy to talk my experience. I was fined $15,000 by security regulators because I hired too many people. Because I hired too many people, I incurred over $500,000 in legal bills defending myself because I hired too many people. Because I hired too many people, I have been on a hiring freeze ordered by regulators for three years. They have not let me hire people. They have not let me open new offices, despite the fact that I was dying to do it. I had plenty of demand. My business was growing, unfortunately, thanks to what you guys were doing. But regulators prohibited me from doing this. And there are all sorts of ways that rules and regulations have inhibited my business. In fact, it is now so expensive. I started my securities firm in, in 1996. There is no way that I could have started that firm today. I have an entire compliance department. It costs me millions of dollars a year just to stay in business, just to comply with rules and regulations that are not doing anything to protect my customers. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. We appreciate that uh, good testimony. Mr. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, uh, you get the, the last five minutes here. Mr. Chairman, other members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear at today's hearing. Everybody knows that the current employment situation is dire. What is less well known is that the roots of our present jobs crisis uh, go deeper than the Great Recession that began in 2008. The share of adult Americans who are employed peaked at an all-time high of 64.4 percent back in 2000, that is 11 years ago, and never recovered since. In 2007, before the financial crisis, of 2008 and the ensuing recession, the employment to population ratio had fallen down to 63 percent. It now stands at 58 percent, the lowest level since 1983. For public policy to be effective in dealing with this grim situation, it needs to be based on a clear understanding of where jobs come from. And on that question, a research from the Kauffman Foundation, my employer, leaves no doubt. New firms are the main engine of job creation in this country. Specifically, from 1977 to 2005, there were only seven years in which existing firms created more jobs than they destroyed. So the bottom line is simple. Uh, without startups, there would be no net job creation in the United States. Additional Kauffman Foundation research reveals that the engine of new jobs began sputtering before the Great Recession. Since this data show that the number of new employer businesses created annually began falling in 2006, dropping to 27 percent by 2009. Meanwhile, the average number of employees per new firm has been trending gradually downward since 1998, and the pace of job growth at new firms during their first five years has been slowing since 1994. The timing of the deteriorating employment situation suggests that the problem is structural, not merely cyclical. And structural problems call for structural solutions, not temporary stimulus, but permanent policy changes. Specifically, the ultimate answer to restoring prosperity and vigorous job growth lies in policy reforms that create a favorable environment for the creation and growth of new businesses. Barriers to entrepreneurship need to be identified and systematically dismantled. This conclusion is further supported by my own research into the growth challenges confronting not only the United States, but all advanced countries operating at the technological frontier. My findings regarding what I call frontier economics can be summarized as follows. The available sources of growth and the policy requirements of growth change over time with a country's advancing economic development. What may work at one stage of development won't work in another. In particular, as countries get richer, they become ever more heavily dependent on homegrown innovation, as opposed to merely expanding existing opportunities or borrowing good ideas from abroad in order to keep the growth machine humming. And since new firms play a vital role uh, in the innovation process, that means that removing barriers to entrepreneurship becomes increasingly important to maintaining economic dynamism and prosperity. In an effort to identify the kinds of policy reforms needed to reduce structural barriers to entrepreneurship and job creation, the Kauffman Foundation unveiled in July of this year a series of legislative proposals that we call the Startup Act of 2011. Let me review the major elements of this plan. Uh, an entrepreneur visa along the lines of the revised Kerry Luger Startup Visa Act, green cards for foreign students that receive so-called STEM degrees, degrees in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, exemption from capital gains taxation for investments in startups held for at least five years, 100 percent exclusion from corporate income tax for qualified small businesses on their first year of taxable profit, followed by a 50 percent exclusion for the next two years, allowing shareholders of companies with market valuations under $1 billion to opt out of Sarbanes-Oxley requirements 
since those requirements are supposed to protect shareholders, then we think shareholders should be able to have the say as to whether they want that protection or not. Higher fees for better, faster service at the Patent and Trademark Office to clear the backlog at PTO. I believe that provision is included in the uh, patent reform legislation uh, now nearing completion. Mandate that all <clears throat> Federal research grants to universities be conditioned on universities affording their faculty members the ability to choose their own licensing agents rather than having to rely, as they do at present, on their own, own university's technology licensing office. Institute a requirement that all major regulatory rules sunset automatically after 10 years. Subject all proposed and existing major regulatory rules to uniform cost-benefit analysis and institute monitoring of the business climate in states and localities along the lines of what the World Bank's Doing Business Report uh, does for different countries. The proposals contained in the Startup Act can uh, represent a kind of greatest hits collection picked from a far broader set of promising reform ideas. Some of these other ideas can be found in a book published this year by the Kauffman Foundation entitled Rules for Growth. Uh, a great deal of additional work will need to be done beyond these proposals, but in the current crisis, uh, first steps are urgently needed. Uh, we believe that the proposals put forward in this Startup Act would make excellent first steps towards restoring job creation and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Mr. Schiff, your, your uh, testimony um, actually reminded me of a comment a friend of mine made to me several years ago, actually, four or five years ago. Um, he has got a brother, him and his brother, two, both, both friends of mine, um, Mike, the older one, typically the more direct one, said to me one time, he said, Jim, I love being in business. I hate being an employer. And I hate being an employer, in Mike's direct way, because of all this stuff you make us do. And he pointed right at me, talking about government. And it is not that Mike doesn't like people and wants to hire them. It is just he said exactly what, maybe not as eloquently as you put it, but exactly what you said. All the regulatory things that government makes them do is what makes it so tough for people to hire. I think Ms. Boucher in her testimony talked about $1.9 trillion, I think that was the number, uh, doctor, that you cited that companies are sitting on. And they are sitting on this, I, I believe, just as sure as I am sitting here, for exactly the reason that, that Ms. Furch got Roth talked about. They are looking at what is coming. They are they're seeing the health care. There is no definitive answer on health care, and we are not going to get one until maybe 14 months we will get at the next election. But there is no definitive answer on what is ultimately going to happen. So they know they got to hold some money for that. Plus, I would make this case, and this is what I want you all to comment on, this idea that the spending, which is the, the deficits we are running, piling up the debt we are piling up, the job creators out there deep down understand they are probably going to have to pay for that, too. At some point, that has got to be paid off as well. And I would argue that, maybe more than anything, is the, is the biggest uncertainty they face. I think there is this huge link between the spending and the failure to create jobs. So um, a couple things that, that I, I want to run by. Would a freeze, like, well, talk to me about the spending, and we will run down the list here, and then, or, or down the line. And also the regulatory issue. Senator Johnson has a bill which simply says no more, no more new regulation, just stop the damage where it is at. And I want your thoughts on that, plus on this link between the spending and, and the job creation. We will start with Professor Taylor and work down the list or down the lines. I think me. a moratorium on new regulation would help a lot, absolutely. Uh, you heard the testimony here that confirms that, and I have seen it myself. This firms are sitting on a huge amount of cash. Not all of them have it, but a large number do. So that would remove a lot of uncertainty. Second part of your question, I do think this, the debt and the uncertainty about how it is resolved creates uncertainty. Will there be a, a tax increase? Yeah. Uh, w will there be inflation? Will there be deflation? I mean, it is just a huge amount of uncertainty. And, and by, I would say, outlining a coherent strategy to deal with that debt, that is credible would, would be the best stimulus I can think of. The, the one word I have heard more, more than anything else over the last few years, last three years, uh, relative to our economic situation and the lack of growth is uncertainty. And, and I just am failed to be convinced that temporary, so called temporary fixes, how that alleviates the underlying uncertainty. I just, I just don't see how that. I think, I think it makes it worse. I mean, even the, even the people who use these models to say it is going to boost the economy, always emphasize it is short term. Yep. You know, it is not a fixing growth. So we are going to, even if it works, as some of them said, I don't believe it will, they predict a few months from now we will be back in the same dismal place. So yep. that is what the models are saying. Thank you, Professor. 
Uh, uh, yes, I think a moratorium on new regulations would be very helpful. Also, a hold on all existing uh, regulations that are right now going through the notice of proposed rule and comments well, so, uh, to include those. Uh, I would add to the uncertainty not just over the debt, but also over taxes. You recall that in December we went through a whole um, you know, discussion, yeah. debate as to what to do with taxes. Finally, they were kept at the current level for the next two years. In every speech, President Obama says that he wants to raise them. He just proposed raising them yesterday in the bill that he sent to Congress. So even though Congress said that taxes were going to remain the same, no, the President is sending a completely yeah. different message. Nine months later, we are changing already, right, or the proposal to change exactly. already. Exactly. Yes. yes, that is right. And every speech he has, he says millionaires and billionaires should pay more, by which he means people earning over $200,000 a year mm -hmm. in his Dr. specific proposals. Thank you. Dr. Boucher. Well, I want to make three quick points. Um, first, on the issue of regulations, I think we need to be very careful that we are very specific about what we are talking about. In today's New York Times, for example, there was an article about whether or not the FDA would regulate new forms of E. coli in our hamburgers. Now, that creates a level playing field, so every producer knows that everyone else needs to make sure that they are not allowing hazardous um, foods. That is an important regulation, and certainly it costs businesses money, but that is important for consumer health. I don't know when I see that hamburger what is inside of it. That is critical. So this sort of blanket regulatory stuff, we need to dig down deep into that. Second, um, you know, we had an over 8 percent drop in GDP because of the crisis. That is a massive hole to fill. And I concur with um, my colleagues over here that you know, it may have been that the housing bubble was at an elevated level of um, demand flowing through the economy because of the housing bubble, but that doesn't change the fact that when you pull it out of the economy, you have a gaping hole and that's left 14 million people out of work. It is that hole that government spending is the only entity right now can fill unless we are going to dramatically increase our expertise. Very quickly, my third point. Around this uncertainty question, certainly, there is always uncertainty in the economy. But I think we should have been asking ourselves in the early 2000s how we were going to pay for those massive tax cuts that we did when we were also funding two, having two unfunded wars. I didn't hear as much discussion around that then, but those are the kinds of questions we should have been asking and a part of why we are here today. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Schiff. Sure. Well, first of all, you know, um, <coughs> Demand doesn't come from government spending. Inflation comes from government spending. Demand comes from supply. You can't consume something that isn't produced. So uh, that's uh, we have to make things first. But as far as regulations are concerned, certainly we we need to stop piling new regulations on top of the existing regulations. But more importantly, we got to start repealing a lot of the rules and regulations that are already in place. Look, there are millions of Americans that are unemployed. How do we decrease increase the demand for labor? It's simple. You bring down the cost of labor. Regulations substantially increase the cost of employing people, yep. and as a result, fewer people are employed. I mean, there are simple things you can do, from getting rid of the minimum wage law, which you could do this afternoon, uh, which would create millions of jobs, and more importantly, you know, help people get trained for much higher-paying jobs in the future. Right now, you know, they, they're never going to get jobs. But the, the, the regulations that increase labor costs and that subject employers to all sorts of lawsuits if they don't create jobs in precisely the manner that some bureaucrat thinks they should be created. You have to let level the playing field between employers and employees. You can't lose your rights because you hire somebody. You can't give workers some kind of special privilege and then call it a worker's rights. Workers don't have special rights because they get a job. Everybody has individual rights, and you shouldn't lose them because you hire somebody. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. If you can be, and I apologize, your last year, but be brief because we want to get to Mr. Cummings. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I sympathize with the idea of a regulatory moratorium, uh, but I would point out that that too is another temporary uh, fix. Yeah. Okay. Um, Good point. Uh, that moratorium won't last forever, uh, nor should it. Uh, what we need is a permanent change in the regulatory process. Uh, a couple of the proposals in our Startup Act go to that. Good. Uh, first, uh, cost benefit analysis. Uh, instituted uniformly for all major new rules, and second, and perhaps even more importantly, a 10-year sunset provision for all major regulatory rules, so they have to be reapproved uh, again uh, and not just go on forever. Now I want to yield to the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You can have some extra time. I apologize. Thank you very much. The, you know, in a day and age when China is spending 9 percent of their GDP on infrastructure, 9 percent. We are spending less than a half of a percent. We have got in Maryland, in, in my district and in the State of Maryland, about every half an hour a pothole opening up. A pothole, I mean, these, in other words, the, the pipes bursting, got bridges in disrepair, 
President Obama, President Obama, is about to go to Ohio and talk about 95 bridges that are in disrepair. You know, at some point, there is no one in this room who, if you had a house, you wouldn't repair it and maintain it. Just maintain it. Because if you don't maintain it, it will, it will, it will fall apart from the inside. And it seems to me that the portion of the American Jobs Act that addresses infrastructure is so very, very, very important. You know, it makes no sense if you are riding down a road, like the one in uh, the bridge in Minnesota, on your way home from work, kids in the back seat, in one of the greatest countries in the world and the damn bridge collapse. At some point, we need to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's get this right. China is about to build 100 airports, and we are spending, we're spending less than a half a percent on our infrastructure? Something's wrong. So it seems to me that, you know, and the thing that I guess that gets me is we seem to go this ring around the rosy thing. Folks say, don't tax the rich in a recession, but yet and still the very people that work for this committee will probably end up taking a 10 percent pay cut. They say, but what about them in a recession? What about the secretary who's only making $50,000, who wrote some of the things that we're asking this morning? What about her? What about her two kids? And so then we say, okay, uncertainty. Well, the debt ceiling thing that we just went through created some of the greatest uncertainty that could exist. We saw that. People looked at us and like we were fools, and they were totally disgusted. They said they can't even get it together to pay the debts that we've already made. Not the debts that's coming, but the debts we've already made. We saw what Standard & Poor's did. So you talk about uncertainty. And then the other thing that I guess that concerns me, when we talk about these regulations, it's interesting that we act like President Obama's administration was the only administration that created regulations. Ah, he's only been in office two and a half years. Most of these regulations were created over the years. And so now we say, let's take away the regulations. Let me tell you what worries me. And I used to be an employer of a small firm, law firm. One of the things that worries me is that we, we give the tax cuts to business who are not hiring. We look out for the banks who are not lending. We, if we cut out the regulations, making it possible for business to make even more money, and by the way, there's no guarantee when you get rid of the regulations that it's going to lead to them hiring more people, even if they're saving money, because then maybe the, then the thing still becomes, the issue becomes uncertainty. And so we go this ring around the rosy. At some point, we got to say, wait a minute, let's get off of this merry-go-round and begin to create jobs for people, when they look at this and they hear this, the people in my district, I can hear them now. If they're watching, when I get home tonight, they'll say, Cummins, they don't get it. They don't get that I was not able to pay for my kids' tennis shoes when they got ready to go to junior high school. They don't get that I'm losing my house. So some kind of way, we have got to figure out how do we come together to begin to address these issues. It's not... And I don't, and I, and I just think that there are solutions. But then, when people tell me, "Well, government doesn't doesn't need to play but so much a role, or can't play but play with so much," government does have a role. Private business has a role. All of us know that seventy percent of GDP is dependent on, on consumer confidence. And so then I look, and I, and I keep hearing this stuff about regulations, 
I have said it in this committee, and you have probably heard me say it, Mr. Schiff, and thank you for coming back to us again. But one of the things that I have said is that when I was a little boy, when I was in, in high school, I used to work at Bethlehem Steel. And when I would go to Bethlehem Steel in, 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 during the summer to work, when you came out of Bethlehem Steel after about, if you blew your nose in a half an hour of being on the premises, black stuff came out in your mucus. I, 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 I think we need to be careful with regulations and that we need to keep in mind why we have regulations. They are to protect the health, welfare, and safety of Americans, of our children. I don't want my child to have to go to the Bethlehem Steel if it still was in existence and, be, and, and, and when he blew his nose, stuff comes out like it did when I did, when it happened to me 40 years ago. I don't want that. We're better than that. And so I just think that there's some kind of way that, you know, government does have a role. I think repairing our infrastructure is extremely important. I think we need to, and, and I think that that will spur on uh, folks working. I see it in the neighborhoods. You can say what you want about the stimulus bill, but I can bring a whole, I can bring this, a room full of people who will tell you that they were not able, if, if it were not for the stimulus bill, they would not have had jobs. I know that it has, has, it effect, has its effect. I think that any stimulus type of action needs to be very carefully planned. I need, I, and I think it needs to be very targeted, but, but it has a role. But then business needs to do something for us. The businesses that have benefited tremendously from Americans when the times were good, maybe they need to say, you know what, it's time for us to start doing some things too and staying here in this country and making it in America, as Stanley Hoyer says. And so, Ms. Uh, Dr. Boucher, would you give a comment on what I just said? I've only got 20-some seconds, 15. Doctor, could you just put the mic? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Um, you made some very eloquent points. I think one thing about infrastructure that we um, that we fail to, th to talk about enough is just how much it benefits small, medium, and large businesses in America. You talk about the importance for jobs, and you talked about the importance for infrastructure inv investments in keeping up with China. You know, I think about the small business owner across the street from me who owns a restaurant. And over the past few years, the water main has broken three times, and so each time his business closes, and we're out in the street talking, he's talking about how hard it is. Now, because of recovery dollars, they are out there repairing those pipes, giving us new pipes. They are, they are 100 years old here in the District of Columbia, and that is fantastic. That is exactly what we need to be doing so he can be competitive and so America can compete in the 21st century economy. So I think those are it is exactly what we need to be thinking about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, real quick, before going to the ranking member, I just want one question that, that Mr. Cummings, I think, raised. Uh, professor, did S&P downgrade the bond rating in the United States of America? in your judgment, because we had a vigorous debate in Congress about what should happen relative to the debt ceiling, or did they downgrade us because the deal that was put together didn't address the gravity of the problem? They mentioned the, the ongoing accumulation of debt they saw coming down the road, and that uh, that had not been changed enough by the budget deal. Um, people think they commented on the way the budget was put together. I think it represents um, an accomplishment that something was done. Something actually was done. Compa compared to the first budget that the President submitted in February of this year, there is a substantial change in direction from that deal. And, and so I think there is some positive there, but I think S&P was looking at the fact they wanted more. Ms. Ms. Forscott, if you could just briefly comment, uh, was it the vigorous debate that caused the downgrade or was it the deal put together and, and, and the lack of real spending and uh, reductions and savings over the, over the? Before the downgrade, they said they wanted to see $4 trillion in debt reduction over the next 10 years. Uh, that was under discussion at some part of the process, but then uh, it fell by the wayside. If they had had the $4 trillion in debt reduction, then my impression is they would not have done the downgrade. 
Right. And uh, I agree that infrastructure spending is very important. It does not mean that that is necessarily a role for the government. In Europe, there are many examples of roads, bridges being leased to the private sector uh, over a period of years, and then they do the repairs themselves. Yeah. Dr. Boucher, real quickly, which was it? Vigorous debate or the deal itself? I think it was both, but I also just want to note that you know these are the folks that didn't weren't able to call the housing bubble and that you know did not uh, did not sufficiently downgrade many of the firms that yeah. led to the financial collapse. But, but it, nevertheless, it's the first time in 70 years the United States bond rating. It certainly rating was, but I mean, I just right. I, you know other people say similar things. So which one? Well, you say it's both. Which one had a bit more more weight on their decision? I mean, I don't. I, in their view, in their statements, it was what uh, Diana Forthcott Ross said about them wanting a bigger deal. But again, I would take their. Uh, think about the deal. Just, just to remind Doctor what the deal was: a fourteen trillion dollar debt. We raised a two point four trillion. We got twenty one billion in savings the first year. I always tell folks you got to put it in family terms. This is the kid gets a credit card, runs a bill up to fourteen thousand, says, "Well, you know what? That's just not enough." Goes to the bank. The bank says, "All right, we'll give you twenty four hundred more, but you have to promise us." Over the course of the next year, in your budget that you planned on spending, you will spend $21 less than you planned on spending. That was the deal. I would argue Standard & Poor's downgraded this because of the, the lack of the deal, the agreement addressing how serious this situation is. And, to, and for, to insinuate that, oh, it was because Congress had a vigorous debate, I thought that's what we are supposed to do in Congress, right? Congress is certainly supposed to have a vigorous yes, debate. Exactly. Part of the puzzle, though, was that this Congress refused to put raising taxes, especially on the wealthy, as a part of that package. And that would have been an important way to get to the goal that SP wanted. I mean, you sort and of. an important way to tax the people who create jobs, too. And, yeah. and that caused the crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Schiff. It, it was and definitely. I'm, we're it was, get to the good doctor from Tennessee next and then our it, it, was, it was definitely the deal, not the discussion. And you know, with due respect, you know, I, I did uh, call the, the financial bubble and I, I criticized S&P and Moody's and Fitch at the time for putting AAA ratings on bonds that I knew were going to go to zero. And in my opinion, S&P didn't downgrade the United States far enough. That is the problem. But I, I would love to address some of the points that Mr. Cummings make it, made. Make it real quick, if you could, Mr. Schiff, because I want to get to um, well, he made so many points, but you know, you're right about one thing: that the, the bad regulation didn't start under Obama. We have a lot of, of regulations that need to be undone. But it's not just the intent. I don't argue with you that in some cases the intent of the regulation is good. The problem is the consequences are the exact opposite of the of the intent. And infrastructure, you know, infrastructure spending doesn't stimulate the economy. It drains the economy of resources. Infrastructure only helps in the long run when you finish the project if it raises the productivity of the nation. But in the meantime, we are too broke. China can put in these airports because they are rich. We are broke. Before we can afford to improve the infrastructure, we need to have more serious restructuring of our economy. We have to start making stuff. We need more factories before we can start figuring out how to make our roads prettier. Mr. Lindsay, real quick, was it the debate or the deal? So I can't speak for S&P. I don't work there. I wasn't privy to all their deliberations. From my own perspective, the combination of an utterly unsustainable fiscal situation and a political process does, that does not look like it is terribly serious about coming to grips with it uh, merited an alarm bell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 15 seconds. 15 seconds for the ranking member. The good doctor from Tennessee. Uh, let me just say this. I have read this 50 million times. Their concern was that there were members of Congress that were going around talking about letting, not raising the debt ceiling. That's what they, that was one of their major concerns, and saying we don't, we don't have to do that. That's, that, that's, that's what, what you should have done. If you, if you didn't raise the debt ceiling, then we could have cut spending. So you said that we were paying our bills. We don't pay our bills by going deeper into debt. That's avoiding paying our bills and guaranteeing eventual default. The gentleman from Tennessee, the good doctors recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was one of those guys going around saying that uh, we shouldn't raise the debt ceiling without significant cuts. And we saw what happened because we didn't get significant cuts. And I'm, I'm all in favor of uh, rebuilding our infrastructure and uh, making our bridges safe. We had a bridge in Minnesota that collapsed years ago, and that's become the poster child for our, our failing infrastructure. We have millions of bridges that work just fine. But the point is, you know, what I don't get is how we're going to pay for this. We continue to borrow and spend money. We've got a stimulus two coming up that uh, we need to talk about here a little bit to see if it's feasible and how it's going to be paid for. But uh, you know, I, I do agree with Mr. Cummings that uh, it doesn't matter really where these regulations came from. The fact is that there's too darn many. And in the American Jobs Creators Tour and my uh, stops across Tennessee, the number one 
uh, complaint and impediment to job growth, according to the 30-plus industries I have visited, is that we need to get government out of the way. And we are simply not doing that with this. We are looking at 219 new regulations by this President, costing over $38 billion, and this new plan that was just proposed is going to show uh, an increase of 10,000 new regulators a year. Certainly that doesn't seem to be solving the problems that we are set out to do. Uh, as far as paying for this, um, Dr. Uh, Boucher, you said that uh, you know, it is time to increase taxes on the, on the rich or we are going to get back into this let us spread the wealth mentality to get ourselves out of the, uh, the problem. Uh, how exactly uh, do you think that that is going to solve the problem? And, and as far as the taxes on the rich and the uh, re removal of the deduction uh, in the uh, charitable contribution area, can you comment on that and how you think that is going to solve the problem? Thank you. Um, you know, as many of us have talked about today, we clearly have a long-term deficit problem. We have a gap. We have a challenge there. One of the things that we have seen over the past few decades is that America has become a fairly low-tax country, and one of the things that we have done is that we have extended these tax cuts on the wealthiest. Well, for, let me interrupt. Do we tax too little or do we spend too much as a government? I mean, look at our, look at our deficit. Rel exactly. Relative to other countries. We are a relative low tax country, and we are not a relative. Are high we spender. a high spending country? No, we're not. No, well, not how relative, did we get not in this relative mess? to our GDP and relative to other countries. No, I mean I could, I will, I'm, I would be more than happy after this to okay. send you well, a series of charts that document this. Do you think that taxing or closing the loophole on charitable contributions is going to hurt charities? That is only for families, who, for wealthy families, and I think over the long run, no. I mean, I think that what is important. Wealthy I mean, if families we think that over what amount? Two hundred and fifty thousand. Two hundred fifty thousand so that, for a married a couple. Family. Who do you think usually gives uh, the most a, to charities? It is a wealthy family. Um, those are families in the very top of the United States income distribution. Those are families that have benefited from in, from economic growth over the past few decades, while other families have not. So they have been, been benefited more from the two thousands, more during the nineteen eighties, more during the nineteen nineties than middle class and lower income families. So asking them to pay their fair share does seem like an appropriate place if we are all focused on closing that deficit. Okay. It has to come from somewhere. It can't come from families that have yeah. not seen income gains. Mr. Schiff, do you have a comment on that? I'd like to ask you know, Dr. Bruchet, what percentage of my income do you think the government should take? What would be fair? Make sure your mic is on, Mr. Schiff. Yeah, what, what percentage of my income should the government take? What, what do you think would be fair? I'm, I'm not going to give well, you a number right guess. here. Yeah. Well, just, I just, what do you think would be fair? You say we're not, I'm not paying enough taxes. How, how high should my taxes be? What percentage of my income should be taken away from me by the government? We have a progressive income tax right, structure. But just, what do you think would have... half, 60 percent, 70 percent? How much should they take? Wow, well, gonna, well, that is so gonna, far beyond. Well, we're, we're going to, wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait. Hang on, hang on. Yeah, let me say that, you know, tax, tax well, the, the, rich, the gentleman from Tennessee well, has the time. Uh, yeah, I'll just interrupt. You know, taxing the rich is a great idea until the rich run out of money, and that seems well, to be Well, no, my point is, I'm already almost paying half on a second. my income in hey, taxes hang on a right now. Hang on a second. That is impossible. No, it's not impossible. No, it's not. Okay, this, let me, Mr. Chairman. Um, let, let's let's shift no, gears for one second right, because this is going to go on forever. Uh, uh, Dr. Boucher, do you feel that government, Dr. Boucher, do you feel that government jobs create revenue? And I think you said that the stimulus one had uh, the majority of jobs created were private sector jobs. Do public jobs create revenue, or do they just cost the taxpayers money? Recovery dollars that have gone dollars that go into communities to say build a bridge. You hire engineers, typically in the private sector, some in the public, some in the private. You hire contractors. You hire people that do concrete. You hire a lot of folks in the private sector, and then that has spillover effects. So that if you, you hire that person who has the concrete, and then they go and they have more money, and so they spend it in their community, that is how those private sector jobs are created, Dr. Schiff, directly and indirectly. Mr. Schiff, do you feel that is a good return on your investment to spend those tax dollars that way? I mean, what is your chance of making a profit? Well, first I want to point out that you know, 99 percent of my income is taxed at the marginal rate, so the marginal rate is my rate. And if the Federal Government has taken 35 percent of my income and then another 3 percent for, 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 for Medicare, that is 38, and then when I have the State of Connecticut now almost 7 percent, I am over 45 percent of my income in, in tax, and that is before I pay any property taxes or sales taxes or anything else like that. And if you raise my taxes much more, I mean, that's it. I'm done. You know, I'm already moving businesses to Singapore, moving businesses uh, to the Caribbean uh, to try to go to lower tax jurisdictions. We are not a low tax country. We are a high tax country, and we're a much higher tax country than we used to be in the past by far. 
And um, I, I, um, I don't remember what your other question well, was. Well, I'm, I'm out of time, but I'm just going to close with uh, uh, the fact that, um, you know, we, we continue to, to spend money at an un, unprecedented rate. And as Mr. Cummings said, I think people were, were very shocked at the uh, debt ceiling debate. But my stance, and at least from what I gather from the folks from Tennessee, is they are shocked that we once again increase our debt ceiling by $2.4 trillion and waited over cuts over 10 years that they don't have any faith that is going to happen. So I would say that the shock and outrage with what happened up here was more the fact that we allowed this to happen, that we once again spent our children and grandchildren's money, and I yield back. Thank you, Doctor. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Taylor, you are obviously a student of history, and I do believe if you don't study history, you are doomed to repeat it. Let me read a quote. Uh, we have tried spending money. We are spending more than we have ever spent before, and it does not work. And I have just one interest. And now, if I am wrong, somebody else can have my job. I want to see this country prosper. I want to see people get a job. I want to see people get enough to eat. We have never made good on our promises. And I say, after eight years of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started and an enormous debt to boot. That is Henry, Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of Treasury uh, under Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, we haven't had eight years of this administration, but as the Chairman spoke about, and being a small businessman myself, we keep talking about the uncertainty is what is keeping people on the sideline. I would say it is just the opposite. It is the certainty that under this administration's policy, we have no way in heck to dig ourselves out of this debt. And I am a firm believer that you have to kill more than you eat or you can't stay. I am trying to understand how in the world, with these policies that we are enacting, with no remedial, only punitive actions against people and small business people, how in the world are we encouraging these people to hire people? Mr. Schiff, I feel your pain. Now, you want to talk about China and what China is doing. Well, China is not borrowing 42 cents in every dollar it spends. And it is not as clear and transparent a society as we would like it to be. So all these things are important. All these things are fun to talk about. The reality of this is the trajectory that we are on right now is totally unsustainable. Standard & Poor's was not wrong. If you want to see what is wrong, go back to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. When you tell banks that you have to lend money to people who no way in heck can pay it back, but you have to do it anyways. When I bought my first house, the first question I was asked by the lender is, how much money do you have to put down? And when I said $10,000, I was told you can buy a $30,000 house. Now flip it now. How much do you have to put down? Nothing. Then buy anything you want. We will underwrite it. Doctor. We've talked about stimulus in the past. I know President Bush, I had friends that just couldn't wait to get that check from President Bush. In your opinion, what do people do with this money that they get back? Do they put it back in the economy, or what do they do with it? They largely saved it. They largely put it in their, kept it in their pockets. And we've seen this time and time again. That's why it's so frustrating to hear this proposal coming out. I said, you want a history. We tried this in 1975, President Ford. And soon after it was done, his own Council of Economic Advisors looked at it and said it didn't work. Don't do this again. President Carter came in, 1977. Same thing. After that was done, his economic advisor said it didn't work. Then fortunately, we had a couple of decades which we didn't, where we didn't do these things. 2001, we, we had one. Look at that. I looked at it myself. It didn't work. 2008. And now 2009 is gigantic. Uh, and we are proposing it again. Why don't we learn these temporary interventions don't work? And I think they are counterproductive for many of the reasons you are saying. Yeah. And I agree. And, and Mr. Schiff, I have also tried to borrow money. And I, I will tell you right now, the problem with lenders is they are scared to death because there is legislation passed with no rules. And banks, and I am talking about the smaller banks, and I have come to believe that if you are too big to uh, fail, you are also too small to survive, uh, when collateral used to be what we worked on, but there is uncertainty as to what your collateral is going to be worth. When covenants change quarterly, it is very difficult to run a business. And what I am saying, and I do believe, and I think uh, Mr. Forgot Roth, when you don't have policies that transcend the next administration, but don't go to five and ten year plans, when you see a shift because of an election, that doesn't add any certainty to the way the economy is going to be stabilized. So in your opinion, and I know you, you do the same thing, I have to borrow a lot of money for my business to work, but when you can't borrow it, 
uh, when the regulations become too overburdened, that it makes it difficult for lenders to give it to you. It is it's, it's bothersome to me. So just, I think it is very important that people understand. This isn't easy, what we are doing. It is very difficult, and government has made it harder for us. You have to hit your mic, sir. It takes two to tango. I mean, you can only borrow if somebody is saving. There has to be a lender on the other side of that transaction. It, there has to be something in it for the lender. You have to have higher interest rates. The problem is the banks are just getting money for, uh, from the Federal Reserve and turning around and buying treasuries with it. That is not going to grow the economy. That is going to grow the, the government. But meanwhile, these monetary policies are stifling the savings that we need to grow the economy. And, you know, Mr. Cummings pointed about he can, you know, when people get a stimulus job, he can see those jobs. Yeah, you can always see the jobs that government creates. What you don't see are the jobs that they destroyed to create those jobs. All the government can do is rearrange the resources. It doesn't create any wealth. But the problem is, is the jobs or the wealth that gets destroyed is more productive than whatever the government replaces it with. And so on balance, the country is poor as a result of that. And it doesn't, you know, the fact that if we send out a stimulus check, it's not going to stimulate the economy. If an American goes and buys some more products that were made in China, how does that help our economy? It runs up the trade deficit, and now we had to go deeper into debt to stand that, spend that stimulus check. All of that is counterproductive. And we are going to continue to repeat these mistakes. We are going to keep on throwing gasoline on this fire until we incinerate the entire country. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Now I yield to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Many of us came to Congress uh, early this year to uh, really address the unemployment issues in our nation and get this economy back on track. And our, our, the biggest reason for doing that was what we had seen two years prior in this administration, this overreach, this government overreach, this Keynesian uh, economics where we think we can spend money to create jobs. It doesn't work. So I have spent the last several uh, months in my district talking to the businesses, because those small businesses are what make upstate New York tick. And upstate New York has taken such a hit. You mentioned manufacturing jobs. We used to have Carrier. We used to have Crucible Steel. We used to have several. We had uh, General Electric back then. Um, we have lost those manufacturing jobs. We have lost those industries. So I go around and I talk to all these small businesses. and, and without exception, what I hear from them is get the government out of our way. We comply with these regulations, and then we spend the money to comply. And before we know it, the regulations have changed. They continue to change the rules, which is what Mr. Kelly mentioned. They, cre they continue to create an environment of uncertainty. Now, I guess the question for all of us, because we all want to address this issue, um, what are we going to do about this? And how are we going to get the government out of the way? My own personal belief is, if they would just rewind and get rid of these regulations and just get out of the way and just be silent, I think we would all be better off. Um, but I would like to hear from you. I will start with uh, Professor Taylor. What is your vision? This, I, I can't agree with much, although I haven't seen the specifics of this bill. I just know that the last stimulus, uh, close to a trillion dollars, failed. Uh, I have listened and talked to my um, city and county governments, and so many of them use that money to plug up holes in their budgets. That wasn't what that money was supposed to be used for. It was not used at all, I don't think, as to what it should have gone for. But so we've proven that that doesn't work. What would work in your estimation? Well, the new proposal is much the same, so I, I don't see how that could work based on what I've looked at myself, which corresponds to your observations. What would work is a comprehensive economic strategy to get the, to, if you like, offset what has recently been done. We raised government spending as the share of GDP from 19.6 percent in 2007 to 23.8 percent now. And we are making a small bit of headway on that, but it needs to come back to 2,000 levels as a share of GDP. Then we wouldn't have to have a tax increase that everybody is worried about. We could have some revenue neutral tax reform, which would boost the economy. And then we could proceed with the regulatory issues and I think some of the monetary issues that are also a drag on the economy. So it is really a comprehensive strategy. I think it could build on the Budget Control Act, which obviously didn't go all the way or not far enough even. But you have got a nucleus to work on, and I think it is quite doable. It, it, if, why can't the government? Federal government spend as a share of GDP 
what it did in the year 2007. That is all we need to do in order to avoid the tax increases, to have a good tax reform, and to stimulate the economy. Thank you. I do want to comment, and I had this thought as uh, Dr. Bushi was speaking. This, this notion of, and this is really what concerns me with these tax increases, and many of my small businesses have said, you know, I'm, my margin is about 2 percent. About the time my taxes go up, I go over the edge. That is my biggest concern. And 200,000, 250,000, those are the small business owners who file subchapter S. That has nothing to do with you know, families who are wealthy. These are a lot of small businesses who look good on paper, but their net income is not anywhere near 200,000. But my concern is what you said about these people who have profited, now we need to go back and tax them and raise their taxes. Since when does the United States of America punish success? That is the fundamental. We reward hard work. Our system is one that if you take a risk and you work hard, you succeed and you should be able to succeed without being penalized. And that is my concern with this message about we are going to raise taxes on these people who have done so well. They didn't steal that money. They worked hard for that money. And I think it is very important. This class warfare thing really concerns me. So if you could comment on that in the few seconds. Yes, thank you. Um, so I want to just make three quick points, because I know we don't have much time. Um, first, I was um, happy to see that the President's plan, um, in, uh, when it does its payroll taxes, targets them at small businesses. I think that is an incredibly important thing. Second, on the tax revenue raisers, those are cutting loopholes, many of whom are, are, are focused on families. But I, I want to make one note about the small business owners. Of course, this is net income, right, net of expenses. So when you say 250000 that is it is over what someone is making net of their, um, their expenses. So these are folks that are doing really well, and for the most part, those, those, many of those S corps are going to be very much at the high end. They're going to be sort of your lawyer firms, things like this. These are people who could afford it. But, but the last thing is, you know, one of the key pieces of the president's proposal for the pay for is to tax hedge fund managers at the same rate that me and every most Americans who work for a living are, are taxed at. Right now, they're taxed much less than we are, and that's a, the biggest chunk of change uh, in terms of, of these increases in taxes. So that was the specific piece that, that I think we should. Should be focusing on. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Boucher, if, if these tax loopholes were so bad, so terrible, so needed, why didn't the previous Congress, just 10 months ago, why didn't they take care of them then? I mean, in fact, you can go back, you go back just a little over a year ago, there was even a supermajority in the Senate for the other party to take. So if they were so bad, so needed, why didn't they take care of them then? That is an excellent question, um, an excellent question, and I think that one that, this con that Congress itself should think about. I can't, I can't speak for what this Congress does and doesn't do, but these are, these are were, were, were you talking to them? Were you telling them to do it back then? Uh, certainly, and many of the things that are on the table are things that we were talking about. You couldn't about. get it done with a supermajority in the Senate? Well, I, I don't work for Congress, sir. But certainly this taxing of hedge fund managers is something that people have been talking about for quite some time, that they should be taxed at the same rate as everyone else who works for a living, not at a much, much lower rate. Okay. okay. Um, I'm going to pick up where uh, Ms. Burkle left off on one of the things we thought in this debt ceiling debate made sense was a proposal that we put forward we thought was starting to break through with the American people. We called it cut, cap, and balance, cut spending in a bigger way the first year, not just $21 billion, but over $110, $111 billion. Um, cap it as a percentage of our economy, Professor Taylor, to get it back in line where it's historically been, around the 20 percent range of GDP, and then build towards a balanced budget amendment. So we, th we thought that made sense. We were actually willing to raise the debt ceiling if, in fact, we put that kind of plan in place, because we thought that wasn't some deal. That was actually a solution. Uh, but we also understand the importance for growth. And I, I would argue we need something like cut, cap, balance, and grow. And, and tell me what uh, the tax reform part of a growth component uh, would look like. And I want to start with Ms. Uh, uh, Got Roth first. What, uh, here's one thing also, just, just, and, and I'll get right to you guys. In the town halls I had over August, one of the things that came through loud and clear was Americans inherently want fairness in the tax system. What bugs Americans? I think two things, and appropriately so. And they want fairness in the true sense of the word, not fairness the way the left defines it as, oh, tax people who make money tax them more, but fairness in the true sense of the word. They don't like the idea that 46 percent of Americans don't pay income taxes. Now, we understand they are paying payroll taxes if they are working, but they are not paying income. They don't like that fact. And Americans also don't like the fact that GE doesn't pay taxes the second quarter. They think that is ridiculous as well. So they want some 
fairness component, simplified component to the, to the tax package. But tell me, uh, 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 Ms. What, what you, Ms. First Scott uh, Roth, what you think that looks like, the tax reform in a growth concept that we need. What we need to do is get rid of the loopholes and lower the rates, similar to what we did in 1986. And there was, uh, as you recall, many years uh, of uh, growth and employment growth after that. And that makes the tax system more fair, it makes it simpler, and it is a win-win situation. I suggest a revenue neutral manner of getting rid of the loopholes and lowering the rates so we would end up with the same amount of revenue as we did before. Then with a more efficient economy, we would be pulling in more amounts of tax revenue. Great. And would, you, uh, would, you, uh, would you advocate a flat tax? Uh, Lower I would, the rates, keep, keep multiple brackets or move to fewer brackets, maybe one, one, one tax? What would you advocate on the, on the income side? My ideal would be a tax, a, a flat tax. Other than that, uh, maybe two, two uh, rates. bracket. Okay. Uh, 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 Lower the rates. corporate rate? You would be for lowering the corporate rate? You think uh, that I would sense? also be for lowering the corporate rate in a revenue neutral manner as before taking away the loophole Got it. and lowering the I rates. Think that, I think that makes all the sense. And what about repatriation, bringing back dollars? I would be very much in favor of repatriation. Professor Taylor. There are trillions of dollars abroad that Would you agree with that kind of approach is what is needed for growth? Absolutely. Ta tax reform, which is revenue neutral, should be the goal. And that will increase economic growth because those lower marginal tax rates are lower, creates more incentive, and you generate the same amount of revenue. But also that will generate more revenue because we will have more growth. Right. So right. revenue neutral tax reform, and we have gotten away from that, actually. People are now talking about tax reform to mean, oh, we can now tax more right. so we can spend more. That is not tax reform, as I have come to know the term yeah. over the years. Mr. Lindsay, Mr. Schiff. Yeah, well, ideally you would abolish the corporate tax completely. I mean, corporations don't pay the taxes. Their shareholders pay the taxes. So tax them at the shareholder level. The employees pay the taxes when they, when they, when they get paid. But again, ideally, we would have no income tax. We would have no payroll tax. If the Federal Government needs revenue, let it raise it through a national sales tax. It would be much more conducive uh, to tax people when they spend their wealth, not when they accumulate it. I agree you with know. all that. The argument is always that, well, if we only tax uh, spending, uh, the rich don't spend all their money, precisely. The money they don't spend is what grows the economy. That is what produces the jobs. If they are not spending the money, it is benefiting everybody but the rich. The rich enjoy their wealth when they spend it, and so that is a much better time to tax it. But as far as your, your budget plan, I think Congress is, is, is much underestimating how much time we have to deal with this crisis. I think there is a sovereign debt crisis and a currency crisis coming to this country soon maybe even before the next election. And that will be far more catastrophic to our economy uh, than what happened in 2008. Well said. I mean, I, I couldn't, the window of time to fix this is closing very rapidly, and it's, it just underscores how serious it is. Mr. Lindsay, and then I will move on to our ranking member. Uh, yes, I generally uh, agree with, with what has been said here on the tax reform side. I am in favor of a, a tax system that is as neutral as possible to economic activity yeah. rather than trying to uh, uh, maneuver people like uh, rats in a maze uh, to do uh, whatever the favored thing, flavor of the month is. Um, and uh, uh, as far as the corporate income tax, in a perfect world it wouldn't exist uh, because it's, uh, we have a double taxation. Uh, generally, we should be shifting the tax system. Uh, away from taxing good things like work and savings, uh, and we should be uh, uh, shifting it to, to focus on consumption. Great. Thank you, Mr. Gentleman from Maryland. Excuse me. The gentleman from Maryland. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Boucher, I think you had mentioned earlier that the, per the percentage of GDP with regard to taxes is lower now than it has been in a, in a good while. Is that right? Yes. I mean, but right now, of course, we have had tax cuts because of the Recovery Act. But yes, but it is also lower than many other, most other uh, OECD countries, uh, other economically developed countries. So, in other words, of GDP. And so, in other words, you were saying, I make, it, make sure I understand this, we are paying, of GDP, we are paying less taxes, percentage of GDP, less taxes than we have in a, in a long time or in history or what? Uh, in quite a while. I don't have the exact number at the top of my tongue, but I'm happy to get that to you. I don't I can't remember exactly what the year is. But it's low. Long, yes. And of course we had two wars. Um, we had the prescription drug program and uh, they weren't paid for. And um, and at the same time we were reducing 
taxes. Is that right? We reduced taxes sharply in early 2000 and, and did not reduce our expenditures commensurate with the, with the lower taxes. And it did not lead to the kind of rebound in economic growth that would make those taxes, quote, unquote, pay for themselves. If I could just make one more point on that, in fact, after those tax cuts, you saw the economic recovery of the 2000s was the weakest in the post-World War II era in terms of growth and investment employment gains, and it was the only economic recovery since the end of World War II where families ended the recovery in 2007 with less income on average in the median family than they had in the year 2000. Well, most top economists are saying that the President's uh, American Jobs Act will boost the economy and create jobs. And Mark Zandi, uh, chief economist for Moody's Analytics, is forecasting a 1.9 million job boost and a 2 percent lift for GDP if the President's package is passed as proposed. Alan Sinai, chief economist of Decision Economic States, and I quote, payroll tax cuts are very powerful. They provide a boost to direct income and in turn spending, which is important to growth. Um, this 2 percent tax uh, cut Mr. Schiff, you you're in agreement with that 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 payroll? No. You you in disagreement with that? I think the deficits that will be created to finance that tax I think the deficits that will be created to finance that tax cut will do more damage to undermine this economy and destroy jobs than any benefit uh, we will get from the extra income being spent. And so so as when the president says that basically barring the words of my Republican friends that uh, we should not be increasing taxes during a recession. Um, but when it comes to these taxes, you have a. Let I me. Mean, do, do you agree with that? First of all, well, in other words, when it came came to the millionaires and billionaires, uh, my Republican friend says, you know, friends, and I heard them <coughs> clear. They, no, yeah. no, no. Let me finish. They they were singing from the same handbook. Mm -hmm. They were singing loud and clear. In a recession, you do not raise taxes. And the President said it the other night, said, you know, we want to make sure these folks continue to get this extra $1,500 or whatever it is in that $1,500 yeah. the, on their paychecks. Well, yeah, go the, ahead. The problem is the damage that the government does to the economy is not limited to taxation. It is spending. It is what the government is spending that is damaging the economy. And so if we run deficits instead of taxes, we actually do more damage. Deficit spending is more detrimental to the economy than taxation. I got you. But what we need to do is dramatically reduce government spending. I that is it. the only we need stimulus to, uh, that will well, work. Well, we'll disagree on that. I think we need to do both. I don't think that there is any member of Congress that does not believe that we need to do both. Mr. Boucher, what is your opinion on that? Well, it is hard to understand how government spending I am sorry, Dr. Boucher. <laughs> I like to give people their titles, like President Obama. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Congressman Cummings. Um, you know, it is hard to imagine how spending, um, uh, you know, that right now when interest rates are at historic lows, when people still want to buy U.S. Treasuries, when um, we have this massive unmet need in terms of both infrastructure but all of the massive layoffs that have happened in education around America because of the state and local budget crunches, that those that using government dollars right now for those, it is hard to understand how that is not um, a, a easy for us to do because we can afford it, and B, that that does not help our economy. Having you know children in school, school in school rooms in places across the country with 40 children is not good for America's future. It is not good for America's workforce. We can do something to fix that. We can borrow at historic low rates, and we can pay it back as the economy gets back on track. And I would like to take issue with one thing that Mr. Schiff said earlier, which is that America can't afford it. America remains one of the richest countries on the planet. To say that we cannot afford to make these investments right now when our economy needs it most and get 14 million people back to work is, quite frankly, absurd. We can afford it. It is just how we are using our resources. We, we, we can't afford it. And, and the problem is interest rates are low now. 
They are not going to stay low. We have got a $15 trillion national debt financed with Treasury bills. It is the same mistake that people made who were taking out subprime mortgages. What is going to happen when rates are at 5 percent or 10 percent? What is going to happen when interest on the national debt consumes 100 percent of Federal tax receipts? That could happen in just a few years. Interest rates got to 20 percent in 1980. What happens if they go Madam, there again? Madam Chair, I see my time is up, but I just want to need 15 seconds to say this. You know, one of the things that we have got to do, we have got to invest in our people. If you got kids, one of the greatest threats to our national security is our failure to properly educate every single one of our children. That is the greatest threat. Well, and if we have to spend now to educate our children so that they can take over this world, innovate, uh, create jobs and do the right thing, fine. But At the rate we are going, though, if we are not careful, we will, we will implode from the inside. Yeah. But because the problem we're not is, doing all the things we need to do now. We're spending and not that, educating. We don't that, need more spending on education. We're spending too much, and kids are not getting educated. We need more on the job training. Unfortunately, we have too many kids going to college on government grants. It's bid up the price into the stratosphere. And we have all these kids graduating with huge mortgages and no houses and no marketable skills. I'm I saddened by those comments. Well, Thank you, I'm Mr. Chairman. saddened by what, those, by what those programs have done to our young people. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. I yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Schiff, because I, I believe you are onto something, and uh, I would tell for those that uh, did not experience this, uh, I remember it very vividly because I paid 1 percent over prime for my floor plan costs. So in the early 80s, when prime was around 21 percent, uh, which people said that is not possible, it is, and in the artificially low rates that we are working with today, any type of an idea or a scenario, what could happen when these rates that are being kept artificially low, and we know for the next, at least until the election, uh, there is going to be a low prime rate, but when it rises to what it should be, market value, the effect that it is going to have on businesses? Well, I mean, the, the, the problem, the artificially low interest rates right now are one of the main problems that the economy has, and I think we are pursuing those rates to prop up uh, insolvent banks uh, to uh, necessitate the, the government bubble, the big the borrowing from the Federal Government. And when interest rates ultimately rise, all the banks that you guys bailed out, they are all going to fail again because they are insolvent. They are only, they're only kept afloat uh, by the cheap money from the Fed. Their portfolios are loaded up with low-yielding, long-term mortgages and government bonds. And when interest rates go up, the value of those assets will collapse. But they have to go up, because eventually the dollar will sink so much, prices will rise so much, nobody will lend us money. The dollar won't be the reserve currency. Right now it is kind of benefiting from the fact that there are problems in other parts of the world. But look at the price of gold. It is at $1,900 an ounce for a reason. Right? It is going up because of all the inflation that we are creating now and all the inflation that we are going to have to create in order to keep interest rates at these low levels. And the only way to solve our problems is to let interest rates go up. And they are going to go way up. And then what are we going to do? I mean, if we keep inflating this bubble, if we let the national debt get to $20 trillion and then rates go to 10 or 20 percent, you know, what people are saying now is exactly what they said during the real estate bubble. People used to tell me, Peter, you are crazy. Real estate prices will never fall. Mm. Well, now we know what happened. People are now saying the same thing with interest rates. We don't have to worry because interest rates will never rise. They will stay low forever. They won't. No, and, and you're right. The only thing we know for sure is they're not going to rise before the next election. Well, we don't know that for sure. They're going to try everything they well, can to prevent it. And the other thing that's going to happen is we print money that isn't backed by anything, our lenders are going to say at some point, you are paying me back with money that isn't worth what I yeah, lent you. We are destroying the value of our money, and that is why prices are rising. Oil prices aren't going up. You know, in fact, Ron Paul pointed out in, in that, his last debate, you can buy a gallon of gasoline for a dime as long as you have a dime that was minted before 1965. It is because our money is being debased by, by the Federal Reserve, and that is what is happening. Prices aren't going anywhere. The value of our money is declining, and it is going to lose a lot more value in a very short period of time if we continue these policies. And under the President's new plan, there is a $4,000 incentive for hiring people who have been unemployed for long periods of time. For somebody like yourself who is an employer, and somebody who, like myself who is an employer, who interviews people, are we picking winners and losers as to who it is we are going to hire? Yeah. Well, absolutely. In fact, this is another example of things that are going to backfire. The government is proposing a plan to make it illegal for employers to discriminate against people who have been unemployed for more than six months. The effect of this is going to be is nobody is going to interview anybody who has been unemployed for more than six months because they don't want to risk a lawsuit. 
All this plan is going to do is going to mean if, I, if somebody was going to hire somebody anyway, they'll try to hire somebody who's, they'll try to interview people who have been unemployed for about five months so they can start them at the sixth month so they can get the tax credit. But it's simply going to shift jobs away from people who are newly unemployed or long-term unemployed to people who have been unemployed for a specific period of time. I think the most it's going to do is influence minimum wage, because basically I said earlier that we should abolish the minimum wage. What that $4,000 tax credit does is temporarily substantially reduce the minimum wage for a six-month period of time. So I think on the margin you will create some minimum wage type jobs on a temporary basis, but it is not going to be any kind of great stimulus. And as I said, the deficits that we will generate to finance the tax cuts will destroy more jobs than those tax cuts create. Yeah. And, and I, would, I would agree with you on a lot of these things. It is totally bizarre to me that the people we expect to do the most lifting are the people that we put the most burden on and continue to overburden them with regulations that really don't, in the long run, cost-benefit analysis doesn't play on that. I am not saying they weren't intended, good intentions to start with, but when you look what's happened, and it makes it so difficult on those people who are absolutely being dependent upon to lift that load, it is bizarre to me that anybody could look at this logically and think this is a plan that makes sense, when in the history of the world we don't have any data that would suggest that that is possible. So thanks so much for being here. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I now recognize Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schiff, you have made a very strong case about cutting government spending. Does that include the Pentagon and ending the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? It absolutely includes that. Okay. In fact, I, I would thank put you. that thank high you. on the agenda. I have just got a few. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, Ms. Uh, Fritzgott Roth, in your written testimony to this committee, you make an assertion that uh, I wanted to review. You stated the acting general counsel of the NLRB wants to stop the Boeing Company, which has a backlog of over 800 Dreamliner aircraft on order, from using its new aircraft manufacturing plant in South Carolina to bring Dreamliners. That is on page 5 of your written testimony. Yes. Are, are you aware, uh, ma'am, that uh, the NLRB has not sought as a remedy that Boeing can't produce its products in South Carolina. The acting attorney, uh, rather the acting general counsel's complaint against Boeing says that as long as Boeing's decisions are not made for illegal motives, it can have work done. Uh, it, it can have its work done in South Carolina. I want to quote from the NLRB complaint. This is a quote: "Other than as set forth in paragraph 13A above." The relief requested by the Acting General Counsel does not seek to prohibit Respondent, talking about Boeing, from making nondiscriminatory decisions with respect to where work will be performed, including nondiscriminatory decisions with respect to work at its North Charleston, South Carolina facility, unquote. So, uh, Madam, are, are you aware that the case brought by the NLRB's Acting General Counsel against Boeing is about work that was illegally taken away to retaliate against workers for engaging in acts that are protected under Federal law. The remedy is that the work that was transferred must be performed in Washington, not that Boeing cannot produce planes in South Carolina or any other State. Are you aware of that? Uh, Boeing did not close its plant in Washington State. It did not lay off any workers in Washington State. It just needs an additional plant. But you made a, you made a claim that I, I just want to see what your uh, uh, how you back it up. You are saying, so, you, you, you said that, um, they wanna, that the NLRB wants to stop the Boeing Company from uh, using its new aircraft manufacturing plant in South Carolina. To build Dreamliners. To, to build Dreamliners. I mean, where is the proof of that? You haven't pro do you have any proof of that at all? Uh, I'm going I, 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 I take that as your answer. I, I just think when you come to this committee, you start making claims, you better back them up. Now, I, I want to move on in the two minutes that I have left. I spoke to the general counsel of Boeing, uh, Mr. Kilberg, and this is the information I got from him. Okay, if that's I'll, well, incorrect, then, I would be glad to send yeah, you, you a letter of correction. You better check with him. He, he didn't prepare you well. Uh, I want to go on now. Uh, you know, in the past, there was bipartisan support for increased government spending during economic turndowns. Uh, in January 2008, Congress passed an Economic Stimulus Act, which injected over $150 billion into the economy. There were 165 uh, Republicans uh, who supported it, and President Bush signed it. 
In the spring of 2008, Congress extended benefits for long-term unemployed with the support of 182 Republicans, and President Bush signed it. There is widespread agreement among economists that economic growth and job creation during this economic downturn will only occur with fiscal stimulus from the government. Now, that is not just my view. It is the view of Joseph Stiglitz, who is a professor of economics at Columbia, Nobel Prize winner in economics, former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton, and former chief economist for the World Bank. It is also the view of Bruce Bartlett, a conservative economist who held senior policy roles in the Reagan and George H. W. Bush administrations, and also argues that the Federal Government could increase aggregate spending by directly employing workers or funding public work projects. Now, Dr. Taylor, uh, in, in your written testimony, which I was uh, pleased to be here for, you seem to dismiss this perspective. Uh, do you agree with Bruce Bartlett and Joseph Stiglitz about the positive role that government spending uh, can bring to stimulate the economy? Based on my empirical work of what actually happened when you look at the data is, no, I don't agree. What, what people like that do is they, in, and uh, Mr. Cummins mentioned um, Zandi, they have these models which they simulate. It is their models of the economy, and they simulate them, and the models say, oh, this is going to work. And then they do it after the case. They simulate the same model and say it did work. What I have tried to do, and other people have tried to do, is look at, look at the money, look at where it went. And when we do that, we don't see these impacts. So you might look at a particular project out, maybe my state, California, and say there is a sign next to it that says ARRA. Most likely that was going to do, be done anyway, and they used different financing for it. That is what we found. And with respect to this idea that most top economists think these things work, I disagree. I mean, uh, Gary Becker, also a Nobel Prize winner, wrote a column recently disagreeing with this. There is another, Nobel, Ed, Edward Prescott. So the notion that most economists think these things work? Milton Friedman won a Nobel Prize. Um, Franco Modigliani won a Nobel Prize to show that these kind of short-run things I, you don't know, my, So there is lots of lots I appreciate of your answer, and my make, time has sir. expired, uh, Professor. But what I would like to do with unanimous consent is to uh, place in the record uh, this um, summary of economists who support the American Jobs Act who uh, talk about the value of, of government spending. Without objection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, I just want to sort of pick up where uh, Mr. Kucinich uh, left off, and that is with regards to these economic theories and what works and what doesn't work. Um, Professor Taylor, if you wanted to finish up and then we would maybe just move down the panel, um, there seems to be disagreement, and I would like to hear your perspectives as what works and what doesn't work. We can learn from history about what works. So, for example, in the recovery from the last deep recession we had in the years 83 to 84, that recovery, we had economic growth of average 6.5 percent. We didn't have one of these short-term stimulus things at that point. We had a permanent tax reform, a permanent reduction in tax rates. That, it was no comparison. Unemployment came down rapidly. Job growth grew, unlike what is happening now. And then you can go back to other periods. And it was the 1970s, uh, more recently, and see the same thing. So to me, when, when people study these carefully, they come to the conclusion that the shorter term, um, temporary, and I would add targeted to that, uh, policies don't work. What works are these more permanent, more lasting policies. And that is what we need so much if we were going to get the unemployment rate down. The unemployment rate is high because economic growth is low. And most even the forecasters who say this is going to work predict economic growth will come back down again after a short-term boost. I don't even see the boost. But even if you get a boost, it doesn't deal with the problem. We need to get unemployment down to where it was before the recession, not just to have a spurt of growth and then we are back into the same situation. Thank you. I, I see we have been joined with our chairman, so I will yield my time to uh, Chairman of Oversight and Government Reform, Mr. Issa. Uh, well, I, I appreciate it, Madam Chair. But uh, I really I was watching this in the back uh, between other meetings and, and wanted to come out and show the, the special interest that I have in this subject. So uh, no questions, but please continue. Very much. 
Uh, Ms. Fergut Roth, uh, I think we're up to you. Uh, thanks very much. So, just uh, to uh, build on what Professor Taylor was saying, with which I agree, uh, there's the famous joke: "What do you believe? Uh, you know, me or your own eyes?" The we had unemployment rate of 7.3 percent in January 2009. Uh, it's now uh, 9.1 percent. At that time, about 22 percent in January 2009 of the unemployed were long-term unemployed, six months or more. Now it's 45 percent. Uh, the teen uh, uh, unemployment rate has gone up, the African-American unemployment rate has gone up. We can see that this isn't working. We do need to take a different tack. I would say fundamental tax reform offers the best chance of immediate economic growth together with reform of regulation. I have written about regulations that were passed during Republican administrations and how those should be uh, revoked also. One that I have written about is the incandescent light bulb ban which was part of the Energy Security Act of 2007, uh, and GE closed its last light bulb, incandescent light bulb plant in uh, uh, West Virginia. And these kinds of regulations we need to take a thorough look at. It is already law that we should do a cost-benefit analysis of regulations, but it is not done. In other words, these agencies are breaking the law by not performing the cost-benefit analysis. Just one small example. In the regulation that required the Labor Department regulation that required contractors to give affirmative action for veterans, this is going through the process right now. The cost of taking one day of all workers' time to inform them of the new regulation that was not listed as a cost by OMB. So what they do is they bias the cost to make the calculation look better. And you all should make sure that these agencies not only do the cost benefit analysis, which they are already required to do by law, but that cost such as taking every worker in the plant and not letting them work for one day is included also. Thank you very much. Dr. Boucher. Thank you. Um, you asked what works, and I just want to make a few quick points. I mean, first of all, we all know that this recession has been deeper and more protracted. It followed a financial crisis. There is work by uh, uh, Carmen Reithart and Rogoff that, that shows that these kinds of recessions tend to be different. Now, the recession that, of the early 1980s that Professor Taylor referred to, of course, was very different from this one. It was caused when the monetary authorities uh, started to raise interest rates because of inflation. That is how we got to this double digit. And then in order to get down, in order to spur growth, monetary authorities had a huge bit of wiggle room to lower the interest rates, which spurred growth. And at that time, you could have a housing-led recovery, which is what you have typically had out of recessions in the United States. People go out, you lower interest rates, people buy houses, they invest in, in that kind of investments. You can't do that now because of the collapse of the housing bubble. So this recession is very, very different in terms of the recovery uh, and what we need to do. But second, there is a lot of very um, good research that shows the impact of stimulus. I have cited a lot of it in my testimony. I am going to direct you to one piece of research by David Johnson, Jonathan Parker, and Nicholas Sul I am going to mangle his last name so I won't pronounce it, but that looks at the income tax um, refunds of, the, uh, of 2001 and finds that two-thirds of those dollars were spent within the first two quarters. That money was spent. There is a lot of research that shows how multipliers work and how fiscal expenditures in this kind of recession, not in all, this, this was very different from the early 1980s, and I think we need to be very cognizant of that. Finally, um, I just have one comment on um, Ms. Berthgott Ross' uh, point about cost-benefit analysis. Um, we should also make sure that we include the full costs of implementation, such as when you have um, disasters or calamities that have these catastrophic costs, like the financial crisis, when you are thinking about regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Taylor, I don't know if you would like a minute for, or less than a minute, actually, for rebuttal. Sure. Well, no recovery is the same as others and no recession is the same as others. But that 1983-84 very rapid recovery also had uh, drags on it. Uh, housing um, was not the drag, but net export. We had net exports because the dollar got so high at that point were a drag about two percent per year, negative. And and right now housing is is not going anywhere, but it's not taking away from growth. So every recovery has its problems. What's unique about this one is it's broad based. Investment is down. Consumption is down, firms aren't hiring, it's across the board. And that's why I think if you look and try to understand what's going on, you come to these questions about the policy. 
the uncertainty that it's caused, the worries about higher taxes, the worry about inflation, the worry about deflation. And that's why I think the remedy has got to be to fix that, not to try the things that we know didn't work from the past. And, and I can't emphasize enough that just because you can decide something that a Republican voted for in the past, that doesn't mean it worked. That does, President Ford was a Republican. He had a, te a temporary stimulus program that um, he voted for. And within a year of that, his own Council of Economic Advisers concluded that it didn't work very well and recommended it not ever be done again. And again, Pre President Carter, Democrat, of course, did the same thing. His advisers say, hey, it didn't work. And, and we learned that lesson for a couple of decades. Now we've, we're back to the, the failed policies of the past. And I think it would be a terrible mistake to do it yet again. And that is what my concern is here. Thank you, Professor Taylor. Mr. Schiff? Yeah, I wanted to uh, point out, you know, Mr. Kucinich, unfortunately, he left, but uh, he made the point that uh, prior stimuluses uh, had enjoyed bipartisan support. Well, they didn't enjoy my support. I opposed them at the time. All of the efforts by government in the past to artif artificially stimulate the economy have failed. They have worsened the problem. You know, the recession is actually part of the cure. The recession needs to be allowed to run its course. The reason we are never going to have a real recovery is because the government won't let us have a real recession. We have serious economic imbalances that I mentioned. We have an economy that is based on spending borrowed money. That can't be. Economies have to be based on savings and investment and production. We are trying to run an economy upside down. And in order to maintain it, we have to keep interest rates at zero. We have to run these huge imbalances. We have to import all these goods that we don't produce. We have to borrow from the rest of the world. We have to allow the restructuring to take place. And still that happens. All, and still we allow that to happen. We are not going to create jobs. We are not going to have any real economic growth. We can't just keep repeating the mistakes. But I know and this is a political body, it is very difficult for politicians to level with the American public about how severe these problems are and how they are the consequence of years and years of mistakes made by Congress and by the Federal Reserve. There is a free market cure. It will work if the government gets out of the way and lets it happen. It is going to be painful, you know, just like anyone who has a drug habit. They check into rehab. They will come out better. But it is not going to work if every time they feel the withdrawal symptoms, they take another shot of heroin, because that is what these stimuluses are. It is a shot of monetary or fiscal heroin, and it is not going to work. And it only means that the eventual withdrawal is that much more painful, because we got that much more drugs in the system that have to come out. Thank you very much. Mr. Lindsay? Uh, I, I share Professor Taylor's uh, skepticism of countercyclical fiscal policy. There are sound theoretical reasons, or plausible theoretical reasons, why it could work, but the empirical track record just isn't very good uh, here or in other countries. Uh, the proper role of government is to create stable conditions that are favorable for uh, economic dynamism and uh, economic growth. And since <clears throat> our focus here is on jobs, we need to keep in mind that the job market in this country has been slack for a decade. Uh, that uh, the uh, track record of uh, new business formation and employment in new business has been off trend in recent years, well before the recession. So we should be looking at structural issues, not just at uh, temporary cyclical fixes. Thank you. And I noticed in your testimony you did refer to structural changes versus uh, cyclical changes. Do you think that this, the government's, or excuse me, the administration's new jobs plan includes any of those changes? It's overwhelmingly focused on temporary, countercyclical measures. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, and I too am sorry that Mr. Kucinich left. It's a. Uh, it is one of the, the flaws we have in our system as we manage to serve on multiple committees and multiple obligations. Mr. Lindsay, I, I want to follow up first with you and perhaps others on the panel. Uh, this morning I spoke with the Northern Virginia Tech Council, all CEOs, all uh, involved directly or indirectly in high-tech uh, growth in Northern Virginia, a great success story, to say the least. But the, the, the dialogue, which of course included repatriation of, of funds and so on, quickly went into, if I gave you the money, where would you invest it? And it did seem like the, the message I was getting this morning was if we wouldn't invest it. Basically, we, ha we don't have the kind of stability that causes us to want to make the investment. 
what is it that we should be looking at from this side of the, the dais, where we have been talking to American job creators through our AmericanJobCreators.com, we have been hearing from people what the impediments are to job creation, and we want to deal with those. So those are a given. But what else could we do so that if a trillion or two trillion dollars came back in, it would be invested in America? And, and then I just have a sidebar question, which is, aren't we focusing on the wrong thing when we focus on jobs? Shouldn't we be focusing on efficiencies that make America's jobs competitive in the world, which was the other subject this morning? But if you would comment on that. Yeah, so ultimately, uh, we, uh, we uh, don't spend money in order to create jobs for ourselves. We work so we can have money to spend. So the, the purpose, ultimately, of economic activity is consumption. Uh, uh, but uh, clearly, uh, our economy is underperforming in, in job creation and in, and in making use of uh, valuable human resources. And uh, again, uh, this is the Kauffman Foundation mantra, but if you are serious and interested in job creation, you must look at who creates jobs. And the, uh, the sole uh, uh, source of net job creation, the overwhelming source of net job creation in this country is new businesses, businesses under five years old, specifically startups. Uh, and so uh, what you need to do is, is look at the kinds of policies that make it easier for them to get started, easier for them to attract capital, uh, easier for them to uh, uh, keep their costs of business uh, down by, uh, by freeing them from uh, excessively costly regulations, et cetera. And uh, I've uh, in the, my written testimony, have a, uh, a laundry list of pro-entrepreneur uh, policy proposals that Congress could consider and put into law, um, and that would help uh, push us in the direction of a, of a permanent, not a temporary fix, but a permanently more favorable business environment. Ms. Roth, I know that you were earlier asked a little bit about NRL, NLRB's activities related to Boeing and so on. Boeing is our largest exporter, period. If Boeing can produce more aircraft with less labor, should they be able to do that, or should we consider that retaliation if they find ways to use less labor and thus need less union workers in Everett, Washington? Doesn't the logic of only adding 2,000 jobs in Everett being a retaliation because they could have added 3,000, isn't the logical next step for NLRB and for the Federal Government to say, well, no, we want you to add 4,000 jobs. You figure out how to do it, rather than spending every day figuring out how to build a better airplane with less total cost. What the National Labor Relations Board is doing to Boeing is absolutely unprecedented. I, I just want to know no how, far, how far, if we let them take it, they should be able to take it next. Shouldn't they be able to just mandate X amount of new jobs in order to not be considered retaliation? No, it is in the benefit of uh, the United States for companies to be able to choose their locations and, uh, and to move from one location to another, which, by the way, Boeing did not. Boeing kept its plant in Washington State. We can just have a look at the violence in Washington State over the past week from the longshoremen who are destroying railroad carts and grain to give some indication of why an employer might prefer to build another plant uh, elsewhere if nothing else, for geographic diversity, as well as because of different costs. And this is sending a chilling effect to employers who want to locate in unionized states. They might very well be stuck there if the NLRB continues with its current policies of not allowing them to move. It also puts them at mercies of strikes if there is a strike over some perhaps needless or small issue, and then that is used in future as a rationale for disallowing another plant elsewhere it works to the harm of the United States because then companies just prefer to offshore their manufacturing. Isn't there a record of exactly that happening in Germany, for example, uh, even though they had a lot to be said for locating in Germany? For a long time, you couldn't close an operation or reduce an operation in Germany, and as a result, nobody would make an investment in Germany unless it was sort of a guaranteed investment, which usually was a government contract? Yes, uh, uh, that is correct. And the EU also has rules against firing workers, which makes it very uh, difficult for employers to take on workers. They know once they have them, they are stuck with them. In the past, we have benefited from flexible labor markets. We have created vast numbers of jobs. We have had unemployment rates two or three percentage points lower than Europe. We have laughed at Germany for its 9 percent unemployment rate. Now it is reversed. Um, my fellow witness talked about the slack labor market in the earlier part of uh, last decade, but 
for in April 2006, we had a 4.6 percent unemployment rate. That is not a sign of a slack labor market. And I guess I will ask a closing question because it is rhetorical, but it is important, uh, I think, to the way I think, and, and perhaps your comments will help everyone. How many of you out of five believe Henry Ford did a service to America in automating and increasing the productivity at Ford plants uh, during his tenure in the Model T and Model A? He certainly did. One of the things we can all agree on. Isn't, isn't that part of the challenge we face today, is if you can produce a better product for less, which also includes less labor, that that is how you end up being a world-class creator of jobs? Isn't that the principle that, for some reason, stimulus, simply adding jobs by paying for them, does the exact opposite of less labor, perhaps, but world-class labor that produces a better product for yeah. the last? Mr. Schiff. Absolutely. In fact, to point out, you know, Henry Ford was famous for paying his workers $5 a day. Highest in the world at the time. Yeah, but that was an ounce and a quarter of gold, which at today's exchange rate is $2,500 a week. So Ford's workers were making $2,500 a week, the equivalent. They were paying no Federal income taxes and no payroll taxes. There was no minimum wage and there were no unions. We paid the highest wages in the world, yet we produced the best quality, least expensive products. How was that possible? That was because we had the smallest government. We had minimal regulations, low taxes. And if we want to recreate American industry, we have to recreate that environment. We have to allow businesses to grow and prosper, and we have to remove all the roadblocks and the impediments that Congress has placed in their path over the years. Dr. Boucher, you are sort of surrounded here, so I will give you the last word. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Congressman. Um, I am glad that Mr. Schiff brought up the $5 a day. That was an important uh, point. Um, the reason that Henry Ford did that, of course, was to reduce turnover and to keep highly skilled workers. So um, that certainly tells you something. And um, it would be great to see more employers taking that high road strategy today that we don't see enough here in America. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Issa. I would like to thank all of our witnesses for coming here today and taking time out of your busy schedules. We appreciate that very much. And at this time, this hearing stands adjourned.